something very interesting came about. And, you know, let's back up to the star of 246, which, of course, was James Krause, who stepped in in 24 hours notice into a fight that he knew nothing about in a weight class that he's never been. And by the way, just might have won. I mean, it went to a split decision. One licensed judge thought he did. It was a very close fight. But we do know a couple of things about that fight if we have any kind of reasonableness, any kind of reasonable understanding about this sport. We know that Krause won the first round. Krause took Giles down immediately and then took his back and tried to finish him for four minutes. He was then reversed. Giles, while maintaining position, did not do a lot of damage from there. And by the way, was only in a controlling position for 60 seconds. We know Krause won that round. When I say we, that would include Giles. Giles will tell you that Krause won that round. Second round, good back and forth battle, but Giles did a little bit more. Giles, I think in all fairness, might've even been a little bit fresher. He was a little bit fresher because he didn't do very much in the first round and he didn't have to do very much in the first round because he lost the round, okay? He lost four minutes of the round. That's why he was fresher. He didn't do anything in that round. In all fairness, so Giles comes back, wins the second round. Third round, razor thin, and this is the one where we're going to need some judges. Somebody's going to have to decide this is razor thin and quite frankly could have gone either way. They made their decision. Two had it for Giles and one had it for Krause and everybody gets up and walks away. Where things got a little bit weird, and you guys may not have known this from home just hearing the announcements, but one of the judges gave the first round to Giles. And that wasn't as open for interpretation as you may think. Giles himself will share with you that he lost that round in his opinion. For four minutes, he was in threat of being finished. For one minute, he got into a top control position and did very little with it. I mean, this is just what happened. I'm not throwing shade anywhere. I'm just reminding you of what happened two weeks ago. Okay. Well, one of the judges actually gave that first round to Giles, and that was a little bit baffling when Giles himself would tell you I didn't win that round. So James Krause finds out that the judge that gave that round to Giles, which ultimately gave the fight to Giles, that judge and Giles have a relationship. And I read the whole article, and and it was something about a jujitsu gym and a promotion, and possibly this guy coached Giles, or possibly they were coached by the same guy, or Giles, however it worked out, these guys were teammates, and they spit science. Spent time in the same gym. And there's a conflict of interest there. And is there a conflict of interest there? Yes, there is. I will also, and I don't blame Krause for being, Krause can be anything that he wants to be because he was in that. I'm just a guy that's staring back and just wants to then share with you. Before anybody thinks this was underhanded or dirty, filthy by the judge, do you think it was a conflict of interest? Of course you would have to clarify it as that. I just don't want anybody to make believe that in the world of mixed martial arts, there is a clear separation of contact between administrators and officials, judges and referees, and the athlete. By example, this is an international sport. Both Bellator and UFC do international business. In all fairness, When you have X amount of people flying from a location to another location, in all fairness, there's only so many ways to get them there, which means an airplane. And there's only so many of airplanes that go out of so many ports and can get you from one place to another in the same time frame. I bring that up for you because many times you are going to end up on an airplane, a very confined area, with one of these judges or referees or officials. And by the way, if it's a 14 or 15 hour or six hour or four hour flight, and you're a little bored and you happen to see somebody that you recognize, it is very reasonable that you would go over and say, hello, I'm headed to the same place. What movie are you watching? It would be very reasonable that you would have some level of conversation. Once you get to the location, There's only so many ways that Bellator, the UFC, can get you from the airport to the hotel. 
That's called a van. And they will put as many people as they can that land at a similar hour into that van and take them to the same hotel. It would be very reasonable for you to say to a fellow co-worker, how are you? How was your flight? I'm just sharing with you guys. There is not a clear separation, and there just simply can't be from a logistics standpoint. Bellator and the UFC can't just go all over anywhere in the world and book different hotels. Okay, you know, the the the, the blue corner is all staying over here, but the red corner is staying over here, and the judges are going to stay here, but we're going to put the referees over here, and then the guys in the office stay here while the PR team stay. It doesn't work that way. You grab a hotel, you, you throw everybody in there, now you know where the vans come, the vans can pull up, everybody can jump in, you can take them to the arena, everybody goes in and does their job, they jump back in the vans, they drive back to the hotel, you go to the airport the next day, you get on a plane, and you're probably going to share that plane, sometimes with your opponent, sometimes with your opponent's coaches, your whole team's going to be on there, your significant other should you bring them to the location, and many times, officials. There is nobody that oversees that And there is nobody that should be asked to oversee that and to go to the expense and the logistical nightmares that doing international business could create to keep certain people separate. You just can't. I will also tell you, did this judge have a conflict of interest? Yes, he did by knowing that athlete. There is still a way to judge that fight. You just have to disclose. But did the judge do anything wrong by not disclosing when we're in a world where we all see each other every single... There is no referee that could ever referee my fight if, by one of the rules, I could not be refed by a referee who I know. I've been in this sport for 22 years. I know them all. I mean, I just do. But so do most other fighters. That wouldn't be an unfair advantage to me. It wouldn't be a disadvantage either. We all know each other. Every athlete in the sport I know, most of which I know firsthand because I've met them, some of which I know because I've seen them through TV, but it's a very small circle. I will know one person. I will know somebody who knows somebody. I don't need six degrees of separation. One degree of separation, any athlete in the sport, just that small of a sport. And how many times, I want to offer you this as well, and this is food for thought. This isn't me sharing my opinion. James Krause has the right to be bothered. Now, he's not being a dick about it and filing a complaint and being a big crybaby. He just brought it to everybody's attention, and he's right to do so because he's a principal in this matter. I just want to share for thought that it would be very hard to keep us all separate. Now, you may come out and argue, yeah, Chael, I got it. You're trying to get to Ireland. They're trying to get to Ireland. You guys got put on the same airplane. That's completely different than being teammates in a gym, and you would be right. That is completely different. But aren't we often told in this sport that we want judges and officials who participated in the sport? I mean, aren't we often told that? So now you take a gentleman who understood jujitsu to the point that he was given a belt and went through a system and showed up for classes, and yeah, he had some teammates, and yes, he had a professor. That's just the way that works. And realize I've got a great understanding of this sport. And now I'm going to go and I'm going to participate in it. And I'm going to put it in an application and I'm going to go and become a judge. Isn't that what we have all been fighting for? And when I say we all, I'm actually taking myself out of that. I've never believed. I've never believed that to, to ref the Super Bowl, you had to have been in the NFL or have even played football. I'm one of the few guys that's on the other side of it. But when I say we on broad strokes, isn't this a, a narrative and at least, at the very minimum, a phenomenon that has existed amongst fans of this sport and even fellow fighters saying we want judges in there that know what it's like, that have been former fighters or that have some kind of a belt or did some level of grappling, but that no combat. It sounds to me like we found one. And yet, it's a very small world. The community is very, very small. So who then gets excluded? Does the gentleman who did everything right to become a judge and got went out and got his level best understanding of the intricacies of a sport and then went and applied them to a judging role, does he get excluded for doing what would appear everything is right and that everything that has been asked of him? Or is it Giles who gets excluded 
because he sacrificed, he had a dream, he worked hard, and he went to a geographical location known as a gym that was relatively convenient to his home. Who gets excluded? In this case, neither did. Should have there been a disclosure? Should have it been written down? Hey, listen, I have been on the match with this guy. I know this guy. Known this guy for a while. I'm a good straight shooter. I'm going to call it straight, but just so everybody knows, I know him. Should, is that the way you do it? Because at absolute worst, then the answer is yes. At absolute worst, this is a teachable moment. But I will just share with you. If we are saying that all officials must go to the executive director and disclose any level of relationship that they have ever had with any athlete who they are going to judge or officiate, that executive director better be ready to have their email box full. We all know each other. We just do. We all know each other on some level. I don't have an answer to this solution. And I don't like that after James Krause came out and superstarred this moment that he has to then learn this fact. And by the way, the first round, which is the only one he's pointing to, was a very bizarre score who happened to come from a guy who very clearly has a conflict of interest. At the same time, I would like you guys to understand that I don't know that that judge should be penalized or an executive director should have a a finger put in their chest or that a new protocol should be put in place. It's a very close in a very closed society. The sport while catching on, the sport while being the fastest growing sport in the world, and you want to say all these wonderful things and it's gone mainstream and I get it and I'm with you. I'm just here to share you. It is still very small. And we do know each other. So you get people who have integrity, who in spite of that relationship, have the courage to say what they see and call happened. I'm not here to share an opinion, guys. I don't have one. I just wanted to offer you a little bit of information that if you're upset with a referee for having a conflict of interest, where does that end? Where do we begin to disclose our conflicts? Do we do it at step one? Okay, fine. That might be the answer. The answer might be yes. But if that is the answer, the executive director is going to be overwhelmed with paperwork. Because the reality is we all know each other. Think about that. 